going down. I'm tired of myself. I'm tired of this town. Eminent Waste of Time, episode 72, presented by CW Motorsports. I'm Chad. And I'm Cody. Look at that. We got Mr. CW Motorsports <laughs> here. That is right. So we could go through and talk about, I could go through and talk about all the stuff that I know that you guys do, but who better to talk about it than the I, guy who knows all about it? I suppose. That's right. So we've kind of hinted about little things that you guys do. Well, not little things, but some of the major things that everybody knows that you guys do. You guys do the motors, you do the transmissions, you do differentials, you do rebuilds on all of these for people. Um, but what are some of the other things that you know you want to highlight? I guess that you specialize in there at CW. You know, really, it's a full it's a full service shop. We're probably one of the only guys around that are really doing everything from a basic uh, engine oil change to you know major accessory install and you know remanufacturing engines as far as just base um, rebuilds or high performance stuff. You know, for that matter too. Yeah. Um, we do a lot of custom accessory installs. We just got done doing a big build on a on a Turbo S um, four seater. And it's a learning experience for even us. You know, it's, that's a brand new machine. It's, you know, there's people didn't have a cabin closure for it. There wasn't a heater kit available for it, you know. Yeah. What we're running into is, is this machine was so new that a lot of companies didn't have anything available. We had guys sending us stuff like, well, this works with the two-seater. Try guess, it and see if it fits. Tell me if it works with the four-seater <laughs> and give me some feedback, you know. And it worked out great. And, uh, we work with a lot of, lot of good good a lot of good guys. Uh, Wet Sounds was a big part of that on the stereo stuff. Um all SSV housings, you know, and endless things for that matter. There's a company now that is making a turn signal kit that is integrated with Ride Command. Oh, yeah. Um, which is super, super cool. They We worked with them on that to get that um, corrected. I guess they had the idea out there, but it wasn't exactly dialed in. Um, well, it's a new machine. you got to kind of expect that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Um, what we've also learned is Ride Command is very universal. They use the same thing on their jet skis and their snowmobiles. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I shouldn't say they're their watercraft stuff in their snowmobiles, but uh, it's pretty universal setup. The plugs are all the same. So some of that stuff comes from there, but essentially it's a turn signal kit and horn kit that works right on the ride command dash. That's, that's cool. Pre- that's yeah. pretty nice. So, so we'll kind of get off topic a little bit about what you guys do, but you guys had one of the S4 turbos. Is that the right way? I always yes. forget if it's yeah. turbo S4 or S4 turbo. Or... It's turbo 4 S or a turbo S. Now I've got you all mixed up. I've done it. I've messed you up. The new Polaris that is super wide and super long and, you know. So how similar are they? I know the drivetrain is pretty much the same as, we'll say, like the 18 XP turbos. Uh, There's not really any difference, correct? Yeah. As far as as we know. Yes. Okay. What what are some of the big differences that you saw that impressed you? Because I know you talked about that they're pretty nice under there. Yeah, I uh, I was hesitant about them. I said I wanted one, but didn't know if it was enough of an increase, you know, enough of a gain for me to go ahead and get rid of my Dynamics for one. But I tell you what, it is a totally different machine. I mean, it is built so much better. It is leaps and bounds better than like what the 18 Dynamics is, which was I would say would be its latest competitor as far as you know high-end machine right um the wiring loom i mean so something as simple as the wiring so that from those guys on the on the turbo s they run a heavy duty wire up to the accessory block the accessory block is bigger um the frame is so much beefier with no skip it's essentially the same frame setup it runs the same the same skip plate like a normal turbo does okay but the tubes of the frame are bigger um the mounting brackets are bigger engine mounting stuff is bigger um, axle shafts are you know bigger in diameter yeah uh, brake calipers are bigger brake rotors are thicker i mean just everything about it is essentially bigger and better they've just beefed everything yeah. up to take the abuse and and as far as interior stuff is what i think is the most impressive to me uh, the ride command has the um, if you're familiar with the ride command at all the ride command the biggest issue it had in the past is the volume knob was touchscreen oh, okay. so with the glove on you couldn't really turn the volume down um, now it's an external button on the outside of the ride command. It's got a mute button on the outside of the ride command. So the essential things were if you're pulling up to talk to your group or whatever you're doing and you want to turn the volume down or mute it or whatever, you don't have to take your gloves off. You can just mute it, talk to them through your helmet or through, yep. you know, so you don't have the music blaring. 
talk to them. And then when you take off, you just you're, hit the play button. You're exactly right, man. That's big. That's one of my biggest things. And I can tell you right now that my, you know, my, it's a, it's an iPad and the dash essentially is what it is. Um, and my screen on my ride command has the most marks on it by the volume because I'm always beating on it, trying to get the volume to yep. go down or mute or whatever. And now it's an external button. And along with that, they give you a, a speedometer right in front of your face plus the ride command. Cause so for me, I'm always running the navigation part on my ride command. Cause right. I'm always running nav especially down in Tennessee. So I have a little itty bitty thing in the corner that tells me how fast I'm going, what gear I'm in, right. you know, if my four-wheel drive is on, what suspension setting I'm on. Now you have that right in front of you on a big screen plus the navigation over here on a small screen. Yeah, you have a cluster in front of your yes. steering wheel, like a normal gauge looking cluster. Yeah, and you can pick, so not only do you have an analog speed, you can pick the digital mm-hmm. speed, you can pick analog RPMs or digital RPMs, you know, and, our gear position and what, you know, you have a, a nudge, you have a, you know, analogs in front of you plus a, you know, small four by four digital screen. Right. And then the ride command on the other side that you can also make, show your speed and everything else. That's what really impressed me. I mean, it's little things like that. They, I say they're little, but those are expensive and that's a lot of thought that goes into that stuff. The little digital screen that's between the cluster is essentially the size of my screen that's in my XP turbo. You're, I would say I mean, yes. right about that yep. size anyway. Um, and it just it moves it right here where you can see it instead of I'm having to look over here and down. I can just drop my eyes for a second and see what I'm doing. Absolutely. Not beating on players, but they just released the, I think they're calling it the Velocity. Is that correct? Yeah. It's, it's essentially that Turbo S machine minus ride command, which is all the features we're talking about right now. Yeah. Minus dynamic suspension, $2,000 cheaper. There's no way. Uh, it, when I saw what they released, they, they were hyping it quite a bit, too. The Velocity. Great, it was a great idea. I don't think it's worth it. Absolutely not. In my opinion, what they've done is they've taken away all the parts that are really expensive and hard to retrofit later, like the ride command and the mm-hmm. dynamics and all that stuff. They've taken that away, left the stuff that's easy to fit later, like the A-arms and the beefier axles. I mean, I can buy all that aftermarket, and they've only knocked two grand off the price. It It would cost me... Five to eight thousand dollars to retrofit that stuff, probably. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. I mean, that's hands down is, is right. I mean, the ride command itself from Polaris is two grand. Just, just the digital dash. Yeah, that's no suspension. Yeah, you're going to spend. Oh, you're probably going to spend twenty five hundred or three thousand on suspension I on the shocks. I think it's more than that because I had a customer that wanted to add that to his like sixteen turbo. Oh, you're better off to sell it. Yeah, and uh, we priced it out because you can do it. You can take a. If you have dynamics, you can add the digital suspension to any machine. It's a wiring harness and a program in an ECU, and it's possible to do. It was like $4,500 for the shocks and yeah. the wiring we needed. So realistically, that's $7,000 worth of stuff that they knocked off and only knocked $2,000 price tag on it. A great idea. Don't get me right. wrong. Great idea. It's Not still enough. a great machine, too. It is I'm, a great machine. But I, I think you, if you're going to buy, you're better off. To just spend the extra two thousand dollars now, just bite the bullet and spend it. I think that's what won King of the Hammers too. Is that right? Uh, a, I think that was a Velocity. I yes, he was on a Velocity, yeah. and now he's got tuned shocks. He's <laughs> I know that, that is not a out of the box <laughs> Velocity. Yes. We we all know that, but <laughs> but yeah, it, it was a great idea. Not near enough of a savings to make it worth it, in my personal opinion. They'll sell some. Oh yeah, they will. They'll sell some people that don't. That the that the navigation isn't a huge portion of them, it's it means a lot to me. I do a lot of riding down in Tennessee. You get lost. I mean, it's it's eight. You know, it's eighty thousand acres. I mean, right. It's counties. I mean, it's, it's massive. The state. Yeah, yeah. It's you get lost down there in a hurry. Not the navigation part is huge. And very important to me. Yeah. I mean, when I when I bought my XP Turbo, I they had the dynamics out obviously, and uh, I was debating because basically the dynamics was going to bump it up to be where it's like twenty five was what I could get out with one. And I got mine for 17 out the door. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, then you're talking $7,000. Yes. Is that No, $8,000, if I could do math. Doing about $8,000 difference. I still kind of wish I had done the dynamics and all that with the fancy shocks. It would have been nice. But as I look back, it's like, okay, it's still it's probably an even wash. I'm going to lose my labor if I ever decided to go the dynamics route. But, I mean, I could do it. Yeah, absolutely. But I think 2000 off on a for the velocity, it, 
it's just you're you're cutting yourself short in the long run. Mm-hmm. I think you are. So, like I said, we got off topic a little <laughs> bit there. But one thing that we had talked about when I was at your shop, oh, well, it's been a little while back now, but you guys do Bell Ray oils. Yeah. And I don't – people have this, I'll say misconception because you educated me on it, that the OE oils are the best hands down, no question about it. So why don't you – Take a couple minutes and educate everybody else how you educated me, and not just about Bell Ray. I mean, talk about yeah. Be- Bell Ray too, because it's what you like, and I get that. But I mean, as far as the overall oil misconceptions, you're gonna make people beat me up on air. <laughs> so uh, it's been probably four years ago now. Um, I went to a as a dealer show, and part of the dealer show they had an oil seminar. It was a it was a seminar put on by an independent company that tested oil and oil only. That's all they did. It wasn't, you know, Bellray didn't pay these guys to be there. Maximum Oil didn't pay these guys to be there. These guys were there just to pure reveal the testing that they've done of oils. And they do it in the automotive industry, in the heavy truck industry, in the construction industry. You know, they, they do it all over the board. And what I found out was, and, and I was a Honda guy, as you guys have talked about in the past, and I worked at a Honda dealership, and I was a firm believer, you only use Honda oil. Right. I have a lot of my customers that, are like, what do you mean? You don't want me to use Polaris oil. I'm like, don't use Polaris oil. So what I found out was, is that basically, you know, Polaris oil and Kawasaki oil and Canadian oil and Honda oil, for a matter, was all essentially bottom of the barrel oils. And when they when it come to testing, um, Honda oil, Honda and Yamaha were one of the highest two as far as you know manufacturer oils goes. I think Yamaha Yamaha Lube products were actually yeah, above the Honda stuff. Okay, but the Polaris oil and some of the others were literally down there like with the Walmart branded oil. I mean, it was bottom of the barrel when it comes to oil. Which shocks me knowing the prices they charge for it. Ab- absolutely. So from that day forward, I, I switched. I mean, we run our whole shop on Bellray. I'm a Bellray guy. I'm a, I'm a believer and I've you know been using it now for nearly 10 years and had great success with it. But realistically, any of the good, any of the oils, you know, AMS oil, Bell Ray, any of the name brand aftermarket oils will outperform your factory branded oil every day of the week. And I promise you when I say that, yeah. I mean, I've literally seen the results and they don't just test this in one category. It's multiple tests. You know? Yeah. Some of the guys that were that, you know, were the top ones. I really wish I could remember who they are, but I've never even heard of the oils before. Um, Schaefer's was up there really high. That is one of them that I've known. But, you know. Bell Ray and Maximum and Anzel and Lucas and all those guys were about top 10-ish, you know? Yeah. Um, some of the ones I've never even, I, I couldn't even tell you who they are, but. Uh, they were high up there yeah, too, but. Yeah. It, it was surprised me. I did not expect to see that. You were all. kind of expecting in going, going in thinking they're going to confirm my thoughts that yeah. Honda makes the best oil yes. or, and, yes. you know, Polaris. It, you know, they make okay oil and, you know, Yamaha makes good oil, whatever. And I learned um, in a little bit deeper conversation, but I learned a lot, like how to look at an oil bottle and tell if it's good or bad. You know, and oh, there's, okay. a, there's a there's a code on every oil bottle. It's got a little square on it and it says like A1, A2 is what the, the, big, the big number will be. But all those numbers mean things. And I could walk into a store and grab some oils and tell you this is what you want over the next one, even not even looking at price or even the front of the, you don't even show me the front of the bottle. Right. And I can tell you which one would be better just by those numbers on the back. And I don't remember it as well as I used to. I'd really like to do that seminar again sometime. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see if it, anything has changed. You know, this has been four or five years ago. Right. The industry has obviously changed. You know, there's more synthetics involved now than what there was even back then. But uh, I don't, my mind wouldn't be changed that it'd be any better. Yeah, that you maybe best case scenario, the OE manufacturer oils have come up to the level yes. of Bell Ray and AMS yes. oil and all those. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And maybe they have at this point, but I was pretty shocked to find that out too. Now, there is kind of one little caveat, and I don't know if all the Bell Ray oils are this way, but if you remember back to the Yamaha Rhino days, uh, everybody always asked what was the best oil to run in them because they ran a wet clutch. Uh-huh. Yep. There is a caveat to the wet clutch bit that yeah you're exactly right and that's it says right on the front of the bottle wet clutch safe not wet clutch safe yeah. you know some things like that and is it J J A S M O certified or something like yep, that that's right yep yeah and there's a J A S M O two or something that's right. like that that's for like all the Hondas that have separate oils on there right. and it says right on it on the on the Bell Ray bottle in particular it says right on the front you know for a C R F meaning you know for the race style Hondas right you know separate separate oils. Um, 
I, we run all when we send our engines out. We send out the 10W40. Um, I know Polaris says 2050, but we run 10W40 in all of our remanufactured engines. And my take is, is the climate we live in, and you know this area is that's the best that's the best combination. You know, yeah, for, for what you're doing. That's typically what I choose around here too. If I'm changing in the winter, I may go a little lighter, but probably not. In summer, it all thins out pretty good, and mm-hmm. it's just where I've been over the years. So no, I I always thought that was pretty interesting when we had talked about that a while back and you know, people, like you said, people be angry and they'll say, well, Polaris (laughs) is the best. And And there's guys that say, you know, that's all I've ever ran in my machine. You know, I've guys, old Honda guys that just still won't change. And I still sell some Honda oil because of it, because they refuse to change. And I've got 10,000 miles on it. That's fine. I'm not trying to say that it's not if you you know you change it regularly and stuff. It's going to cause you any problems. But I'm saying, I've seen right. And, you know, I've not only just oil results and I had samples there. What you know what it does and essentially I just took like a metal rod with an oiling and they got like they put another piece of metal down on top of it like on a lathe and it just they just see how long they can take for it. You know, it, before it starts yeah, it sending off filings. And essentially, you'd be be, be supp- uh, surprised like there's oils that only weld things together and you know some of the other oils didn't. I mean, yeah. And a big part of, you know, my you know, somebody says my machine lasted 10,000 miles or is lasting up to 10,000 miles or whatever is just your maintenance schedule. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I always say that if you think you're neg- no, going to neglect an oil change, you need to run a the best oil you can. Market oil. Yeah, you're yeah. right. You know, if you're a hardcore Polaris guy or hardcore Can-Am guy and that's what you want to run their oil and your maintenance schedule is awesome, keep running it. Right. It'll. I'm sure it'll be fine. But a lot of the times... I think where people really need to understand that using the best oil possible is the most important, not that you should, I think you should skimp on it, but this is my opinion. If you're sending a machine out, we'll say to a job site and you got guys that are just, they're just there to use it and abuse it. And that's all they're, they don't care about the maintenance. If as long as it starts, they're going. Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, then you should definitely look into using the absolute best oil as you can. And I, and I always joke, and I a lot of guys that say, you know, well, that's just my pit bike. Well, that's the bike that gets neglected the most. You know? Oh, yeah. It's just it's just the pit bike, or it's just my around-the-house machine, blah, blah, blah. I want the cheap stuff. That's the one that doesn't get serviced. You know, the race buggies and your you know your, your trail buggy, your personal play buggy, you're normally keeping up with these, you yeah. know. And, but it's the guys that, oh, like, it's no big deal. I, I just need it. You don't imagine the amount of time and hours you put on those things. I get guys all the time that say, oh, my, just my grandkids just ride it. Like, those grandkids ride a lot. Yeah. A lot of hours. Yeah, while you're sitting in there, they're <laughs> turning laps for yes. an hour. Yes. I actually talked to a guy, was it this last race season, that he said kind of the same thing about it, you know, his pit bike. And he was he had rode it, not on the track, but back to a back spot in the track because he wanted to check out the pro hill nearly missed his race because the pit bike died back there (laughs) the motor something happened with it i'm not saying the oil that Uh went away and it locked up but if you don't take care of that you could miss your whole race or whatever you're doing so yeah it's just something that i found interesting so we did get a couple questions from you guys from the facebook live stuff that we did so there's just three of them here kind of expound on them as much as you want so how did CW Motorsports, as a business itself, get started. Oh wow, that's a fun one. I enjoy answering that question. So, just so you guys know, in the last year, the business has really grown, and uh, thank you very much for that. A lot of you guys are supporters of the show, also supporters of me, and that's great. I've been doing this now for sixteen years. Yeah, fifteen, sixteen years. Um, I started out a Honda dealership when I was fourteen years old. I rode my bicycle to the Honda shop on a one summer to get a spark plug because like. School wasn't quite out yet, but it was going to be out real soon. I was going to get a spark plug because I lived in a neighborhood where everybody rides motorcycles. We all had dirt bikes growing up. You know, my whole my whole life I had a Sierra 50, then a 70, then an 80, then an XR100, then a yep. Sierra 125, you know. So I rode my bicycle to the Honda shop. I was 14 years old, got a spark plug, and they said, what are you doing this summer? I said, riding my motorcycle. Yes. What every kid does all summer long, you know. And I uh, said, so do you want a job? I'm like, heck no, I don't want to work. <laughs> that doesn't have me? anything to do with riding my motorcycle. <laughs> so I go home and I tell my mom and dad, I went to the Honda shop today and got a spark plug. And I said that they offered me a job. My, <laughs> said, my dad said, did you take it? I said, no way, I didn't take it. I want to ride my motorcycle this summer. I don't want to work. <laughs> so lo and behold, the very next day, my dad gets off work. I get in the truck with him. We go up to the Honda dealership because he says, you're getting a job. Boy. There you go. 
So I started out at the Honda dealership when I was 14, um, basically cleaning bathrooms, sweeping the showroom floor, washing bikes, um, and fastly. I, I already had a big interest in the off-road industry. I've been doing it my whole life and knew my way around motorcycles pretty well. So I went from essentially, you know, cleaning to assembling, you know, brand new units. Yep. From assembling new units to doing, you know, the first services and the oil change today coming in to doing tires. And next thing I know, I'm in high school, um, graduating early and working, you know, taking a half a day out of school to go work during the work program as as their lead tech. I mean, I was there was one other guy that had been there for years. He was an older gentleman. But I was doing all the, you know, I was doing, I was doing a crankshaft and transmission overhaul in high school. Yeah. Um, went to college in a Orlando, Florida MTI, um, and honestly, I would probably still be there today if the economy didn't crash in 08 like it did. I worked at a cycle sports center down there and loved it. I was a, as a, I was a tech down there. I was a working as a technician while going to college. And most kids struggled through college, not me. I was making killer money. I was, you know, working as a, as a technician, right? Making technician style wages, really, really good money, uh, going to college. And I had a blast. I loved it down there. But it was straight commission. And when the economy fell, work quit coming in the door. So I went from, you know, building out a whole bunch of hours when I was there to sitting on my toolbox waiting for work to come in. And um, that doesn't pay the bills. No, it does not. <clears throat> Especially not living in Florida. No. It... Uh, the Honda dealership was already calling me knowing I was going to graduate soon from college wanting me to come back home and I finally worked a deal with them and come back home and uh, I was it was August of 2011 I was hit by a semi no I'm sorry August of 2010 I was on a test ride for the Honda the ship riding a motorcycle I was hit by a semi t-boned by a semi broke the whole left side of my body I mean Every, my whole left side of my body was broke. My foot was really bad because that's the semi truck actually run over my foot. Mm. Um, I spent the next seven months in and out of the hospital, in the hospital for about five of those. Next seven months, I was off work, in and out of the hospital, therapy. I was in a wheelchair for a solid, I was on bed rest for a month once I got out of the hospital, bed sores and all kinds of nasty stuff. Yeah. Wheelchair after that, crutches, learn how to walk again, the whole shebang. And I was already doing some work at home for buddies on this, you know, and I had, when I got in my accident, you know, I had buddies machines in the garage tore apart and they're like, who's going to fix these? So I ended up hiring a kid that I knew in town that knew his way around to, while I was in the wheelchair, he was fixing them. So I was in the garage in the wheelchair coaching him how to fix these things yep. and uh, went back to the Honda dealership and worked for, it was a few months. I think I went back in September and then I worked for a couple months in December one of uh, 2011, I opened my own, you know, realized when I was off that, hey, I can make money doing this, you know, work, you know, in uh, December 1st of 2011, opened my own thing, and there we are, wide open in the uh, in the ATV industry. I did a lot of motocross racing back then, so um, I, did, I had a lot of racing customers. AT, we did a lot of ATV racing. I did personally didn't race ATVs, I actually was a dirt bike guy. So I had a lot of racing customers at first. We won't hold the dirt bike thing <laughs> against you. Yeah. So, uh, well, I've learned, you know, over my, with age comes a cage. So yep. that's why it comes from a dirt bike to a side-by-side. It's much easier to go to work on Monday morning after you get in racing on a side-by-side than the dirt bike. But you might be slightly sore, but nothing like a dirt bike. Exactly. So I went from, uh, I went from, you know, racing dirt bikes heavy to, um, wrenching on them for a lot, uh, Katie Meddy, which was a pro ATV racer, she started off as an amateur, and I was with her from, as we raced for four years, five years, four, five, so five years, had four national championships. Um, she was my neighbor growing up, uh, kind of lived in my front yard, I guess you could say, you know, through the woods, and she learned riding, chasing us through the woods her whole, you know, life. She was a few years younger than me, so me and her brother rode, and it was always like, we don't want Katie to go along, so let's ditch her. Well, yeah, well, she had to keep up. Guess what? She could keep up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd try to lose her again, and guess what? She kept up. So uh, I always joke. I said, you're only as fa- you're fast because we made you fast. Right. You, know, you didn't want to be left in the woods all by yourself. So uh, we raced ATVs with her, traveled the, the national circuit um, running that with her, and got a lot of customers building ATV race engines that way. And when she uh, she finally retired and went off to nursing school, and she's now a uh, she's a nurse at a uh, in New York at a like they do like brain surgery, and she's a nurse there. So she oh. 
yeah, she chased her dream of being a nurse, and we, uh, I kind of continued on, and I kind of realized that when she was done, like, what am I going to do? I've been in business now for two years, mainly doing ATV racing stuff, and my main supporter was hanging retiring, it up, hanging yeah, it up to you know start her, her start her real life. Because let's all let's all be serious here. It's, unless you're Kyle Cheney, you're not making a living racing. Nah, there's not many people making a living. Yeah, doing and it. uh, it's a it's expense and it's it's a hobby, you know. And I just started kind of picking up service jobs at the you know around my local town, oil changes and brake jobs and things like that. I was pretty well known in the community for you know for doing good work, and that's kind of where it went from there until the whole razor boom happened and. So I've been in the razor industry or the UTV industry heavy for about the last two years. The last year really heavy on the internet. Um, and I I went for about two years there, two and a half years, where my whole um, dream as a, as a kid was to own a successful ATV motorcycle dealership. And I did it. Yeah. Um, so I hit a point there where, you know, I was out of, I, I needed another game. I, I was, you had reached your goal that you had set and now you're like, what do I do now? You know, what, what's next yeah. kind of thing. And, uh, I was bored for about two years and, you know, I just did the same old thing. I went to work, worked on ATV side by sides, whatever it was, service jobs, I guess you could say, you know, your typical service, which not bashing that whatsoever. It's great work and I really enjoy it and, you know, helping local Customers means a lot to me. You know, right. uh, I really enjoy doing that. But only doing that kind of felt more like the normal nine to five job exactly instead right. of having something you're really passionate yeah, about. You're exactly right. I mean, I, 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 sorry to everybody that works a job they don't like, but I love my job. You yeah. know, and, and it's fun. But you're right. I went to that point where it was just a job. I went to work, fixed units, went home, made decent money doing it. It was all. It was okay. Um, but I was without a hobby. I realized that racing dirt bikes for me was here and gone because I tried it. I bought a brand new motorcycle whenever I was essentially bored at my point in my industry. Um, and I wasn't as fast as I once was. I thought I was as fast as I once was. You get older, you never <laughs> as fast as physical you. physical fitness wasn't there like it used to be. And I... Uh, it's a great I, thing about UTV. It doesn't <laughs> have to be as much. Yeah. I just, I didn't enjoy it as much. And I realized that I, I wasn't ever going to enjoy it as much because I didn't have the uh, didn't have the want to be in the best physical shape of my life. I didn't have the want to practice every second I was. You know, whenever I was racing younger, I mean, it was every single second I wasn't doing something. I was thinking about motorcycle racing or something like that. I didn't have that no more. I actually tried uh, circle track racing. I, I bought a, uh, a little sprint car and we sprint raced for a summer and wasn't my thing. Yeah. Everybody hates each other in the race of dirt racing. I'm, <laughs> really? <laughs> they're fighting all the time. It's, it's a big, it wasn't the friendly atmosphere of racing that I, uh, that I wanted. Yeah, because we've, used to. we've talked about it and you, you see what goes on in the side by side world. I mean, we're in a racer chat with a bunch of us that just joke around and, <laughs> Uh, you know, somebody needs something picked up or somebody's going to a certain shop. Hey, I'm going here. Does anybody need anything picked up while I'm going or, you know, you know, uh, here's, I always, I use this example a couple times. Um, but the prime example of this, and I'll say names cause you'll figure out who it is. But Michael Plank was at Casey second round to the end. I think it was had a flat tire in the first lap. The next closest point person in points was Cam. Yep. Cam's dad gave him a spare tire, allowed him to finish that race where Cam crashed, though. Um, but Cam could have slowed it down and just finished had he known Michael was going. It, was, it completely changed the points up. Right. If Michael would have not been able to finish, maybe Cam could have. He maybe would have backed it down and not hit the tree like he did and right. finished. And Cam probably would have won the championship in the 800 class. Yeah. But they're good enough people and everyone helps everyone. They're like, you know what? You're broke down. Here's a tire. Get back out there. Get racing. Right. And even Mike came around and was telling Cam's dad, said, hey, when you see Cam, tell him to slow down. He's yeah. got it. I'm not going to pass in. Yeah, you know, just just tell him to take his time and put his laps in. And that's what I like so much about this. Pe- literally, people, I mean, I, me and Steve work a lot together, me and Michael. Plan- I, I work a lot with all these guys, and they will they would do it for me just as I do it for them. Yeah. I don't even question that. Oh, you know? I mean, nothing – Nothing about me. I'm just saying in general. But last year at the last race, Steve was uh, having coil problems. He couldn't get his razor to run right. And he's like, I'm not going to make it. I just can't make it. And this is uh, the night before the race at 11 o'clock. He's texting me. He's like, I can't get it to run right. 
said, you're going to run. If you got to come, I'll drag my razor there. You're going to run because if he didn't run, he wouldn't have got uh, whatever position he got in that series. It's like, I don't care if you rip the A-arms off of mine. I'll put <laughs> yeah. it back together. Yeah. Yeah. But you're going to run. I mean... Yeah. You know, I've met guys late at night at gas stations and things like that for parts. That's what it's all about, you know. And that, and I always say these guys will do it for me, too. And oh, yeah. Says I do it for them. But that's essentially my story in a nutshell. Um, we're very, very heavy online right now uh, mm-hmm. compared to before. Um, we're actually in the process of building a whole new website. It is very, very expensive, but let's hope it pays off in the end. But it should allow us to really display our products and really work on our brand more than what we're at now. You know, it's really tough. We kind of grew our online business through Facebook, um, which was great. That's where a lot of the our, a lot of our sales are coming from. Yeah. But it, we don't really have a good website to direct someone to, and what we do is so niche. There's not a generic website that really works for us. I mean, what right. we're having built is a very custom platform that is going to be should cater the customers very well. Yeah. And also make our lives a lot easier. So we kind of you already kind of covered you know what what's coming up for CW Motorsports. You talked about that, but one other question, and it should be hopefully pretty quick because we got other stuff to get to here. <laughs> um, have you ever felt like in the business in CW Motorsports just like quitting, like you'd hit that wall and you're just I'm done. I don't want to deal with it anymore. That is a fun man. These questions are good. I got to find out who asks these later. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. It gets to a point where um, it's. My, if my hobby is my career, yeah, hands down. And I just said that I found, I got, when I found the rate, when I got into the side by side game, I got a hobby back again and it made me excited about it. But at the end of the day, my hobby is my career. You'll see me out riding and, and no, no one not ask me questions when I'm out, out of the shop, please do. But it's like you can't go nowhere without someone wanting to talk shop with you and um, things like that, which is fine. I, I don't mind it, but that's, that's tough. Some people cannot do that. Some people cannot, you know, yeah. I always say, you know, my phone rings on Saturday and Sunday at 8, 9 o'clock or at 10 o'clock Sunday morning, whatever it is, and I'm answering those phone calls. And if I don't, people get upset. But at the same time, like, you, you're not working today, are you? Yeah. Would you take a work phone call today? Um, I'm paid to. I'm on call 24-7. Yeah, so. That's probably the toughest thing there is, is that there's no separation between work and hobby or work and even home life, for that matter, because it's people with i always say it's got it's the amazon attitude someone they always want it now right they won't wait they won't even wait for a question to be answered for 15 minutes i mean that's just the new mentality of people so right that has made me want to just be like i'm done i'll go work for somebody and i'll enjoy my side by side and i'll start racing and enjoy it again you know? yeah but i do love it i love what i do and uh i think there's big things coming for us yeah well everybody has those days you know but i i think the good thing that that shows is if you get into any business, there's going to be those days Absolutely. that you Absolutely. Know, you're just like, I, I'm done. There's that way racing. Yeah. I mean, how many times you load your <laughs> machine up on the way home? Like I'm done. I am not going, we are done. We're going home. We're selling the race trailer. We're selling the side by side. We're selling everything. <laughs> I'm picking a different hobby. Yeah. And you know, you calm down a little bit and that's how it goes. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, this is a, it's a very mind, you know, it's very physical on the mind and it will make you do that. Yeah, I agree. So, okay, we have kind of a different thing. We're a little bit visual. I'm going to close my laptop monitor a little bit so you all can see. Neck braces for racing. Uh, we've all seen them. Some series require them. Some do not. So I brought the three that I have, and there's one more style that I don't own that I'm not going to put that kind of money out, the Hans, Hans device. device. They're great. Mm-hmm. It's really expensive Absolutely. to get into one. So we're going to pull them out. We'll start at the low end of the you know spectrum as far as the price wise. I want to kind of I'll discuss some of the uh, benefits of it, and we'll let you go from there. Yep. So this is the this is a Simpson brand one. There are many companies that make something like this. We just always call it the foam donut because mm-hmm. that's all it really is is a foam donut. It is SFI rated, I believe. Yes, it is SFI rated, so it passes your fire levels if you have to have that for the racing series that you're in. These run, what, about 30 bucks? I was say 30 or $40, dollars, yeah. Yeah, they're pretty cheap, um, all in all. So the good thing, you have, you, have a, you have a neck brace that passes safety <laughs> passes inspection. Pass, yes. That's 
kind of where the good is. It's about all it does. Yeah, that's all it does. Uh, so your your good points on that one, and so then we'll kind of touch negatives too. My thing on this is it is it's cheap. It will pass tech. It will do what you want it to do. If you don't like a bulky neck brace, this is the neck brace probably for you. Yeah. If you don't think that neck protection is important, also the neck brace for you. Right. I think that's the only part on your body that can truly be hurt in a side by side of the safety equipment they have standard. That's probably true. You can roll them and hit so hard that is what's going to be snapping around is, is your neck. Yes. You know, and I'm a firm believer of that. So this neck brace is not for me. No, it, it's better than nothing. Absolutely. I'll put it that way. It Absolutely. is better than nothing. Yep. So yeah, that's I Cody and I completely agree on that. So number two, uh, this one's made by is it EVS? I think yep. Yep. Um, it's almost the same thing. Now this one, sorry, I'm sure that made a loud noise. This one, I also I tend to have a bigger neck and it chokes the crap out of me i actually i have another one just like it and i took it out and trim the foam so that my throat wasn't getting choked Choked the whole time but anyway this is a very similar one so i'll let you go first on this so this This style this brace is better than the other one if i had to pick between these two it would be this one yep the whole point of a neck brace is not only to keep your neck from whiplashing but to disperse the load away from your collarbone and across your chest and and your back because a neck brace will break your collarbone. Oh, yeah. If they're not set up right, the, the load, the, the force is distributed from your neck, uh, hits the brace. And it'll push on the yeah, collarbone exactly. right it there. It will break your collarbone, um, which is better than a broken neck, but True. still a broken bone. So this brace is better. It is curved to fit, you know, the, the line of your neck. Yeah. They make the, they make this same brace that's even a little nicer that has a kick up on the back that's another support um, that rides the wire by the helmet. Yep. Which is also pretty, you know, pretty good. Yep. Price point of these are what, $75, $80? Yeah, about right 70 yeah. bucks, somewhere in there. And they also make them, this one doesn't have it, but they make them with a anchor point for so your helmet get, too. And they don't float across yeah. your shoulders. Yeah, and this does have uh, little loops in it so you can tie it down basically yeah. to yourself. So this is better. It's not ideal. Exactly. Um so that's number two. One one thing about this brace too is it doesn't affect much harness area. You know, you can yeah. wear harnesses and you're not really getting it. also doesn't affect your range of motion too nope. much. Nope. Um, it still leaves you able to move your head left and right pretty well. Up and down is affected somewhat, but um, it's it's better. So this is the next one. This is also by EVS. It's a little dirty. I'm sorry I didn't get to wash it. Uh, I'll show it from the side profile so that you guys can see how it sits. And uh, this is meant to sit, basically your collarbone would be in this Mm -hmm. space here. And this kind of goes down over your upper back shoulder area. And it almost gives a platform for your helmet to sit on. Imagine your head would be here and the helmet, you would rotate across this. And it also has a sternum buckle to go across and kind of hold it down a little bit better. Under your shoulders. Yeah. So... Good about this brace is is I don't know to say if this brace exactly, but a brace similar to this is adjustable. Yes, so you can make it fit you. I'm pretty sure that you can change. Like, yeah, yes. you can change out this back strut. I think they call it to a short or tall. I don't remember which one's in this right so now. It gets more adjustable for you, so it does. It's more comfortable to wear. Right. Um, stays up off your collarbone, so yeah. it does disperse the load the way it needs to disperse the load. These are great, so the brace isn't floating. You know, right. isn't bouncing up on your head. I would compare this brace really similar to like a Liette or the Alpine Star brace. Mm-hmm. I wear the Liette brace. It is not the most comfortable brace to race with, nor is this one. No, as they you are know. not. Yep. Um, but the protection is there. Yes. And I'll be uncomfortable for an hour for the protection. Yes. That's simple. The only thing, and I agree with everything Cody's saying, the only thing that you have to watch for is the amount of overhang off the back versus uh, your helmet or, you know, in conjunction with the seats that you run because if the seats kick up more and this is kind of riding on it it can push the brace forward which then this kicks up and it drives your helmet down and your head down so that's the only thing you want to make sure on that but a lot of a lot of helmets nowadays are designed to work with a brace so you see how this area is really flat across the back and it's a harder plastic you'll notice the new style helmets come around and they're flat they're, or even duck build up yes, on some of them. They're designed to work with braces, 
Um, a lot of helmets are not designed to work in the brace, and they, like he's saying, it'll try to push the helmet up off your head. Right. They, they're not. They don't. They don't work well with each other. So, um, I'm a neck brace guy. I'm a safety guy. I've been hurt bad, hurt really bad racing. I've been in some bad accidents, so I'll be uncomfortable for some safety. Uh, I think I'm a firm believer that there should be deeper tech inspection than what there really is. I if agree. Af- if you can afford a, a razor to go racing, guess what? You can afford the safety equipment. It should be. Ma- it, it, there's no question about it. You got to have it. And this you know? neck brace, the one I just put down, that EVS with the shelf and all that, what those are 150, 175, and yes. then depending on the brand, they go up go to up from there. Yeah. You know, the Lee two, braces, two something. Yeah, the Lee braces, two seventy five, three hundred. The Alpine Star braces, right? They're all similar braces, all right. similar quality. Um, I personally run the Liet just because that's what I had for motocross racing. Um, I actually bought an Alpine Star brace because of the back of it was a little shorter. Yeah. I didn't like it as well, though, because it went down farther on my chest, and I felt like it was kind of like really taking the wind out of me. Um, it's a personal preference thing. I can tell you, if you don't have a neck brace and considering going to one, try something out. Start with something. Start yes. Even if you start with one of these that are here, the, the first ones, I would suggest at least starting with something like this EVS. It's at least contoured around you a little bit. Absolutely. Or find somebody at the race that has one and say, hey, can I, can I run it? Are you run a different class? Run it, right. You know, wear it for a race. I'll tell you that I'm, I'm a firm believer. And if you can stay protected in these things, you they're pretty, they're built strong if you're not yeah. going to get hurt. You know? Now, the only one that we don't have here, just because, like I said, I have not invested in that yet is the Hans style device. And there are several companies that make them. Hans being uh, head and neck restraint yep. is uh, actually what Hans stands for. And it is much more contoured to your body, normally multiple adjustment points. And you, you can actually get them fitted, like you yeah. can get them molded. Custom for molded chest. to my you. Brother, that's, my brother's a big drag racer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's required to yep. go as fast as he does to have it. But it, it comes way down on his chest, yeah. way down on his back. And then uh, it's a, a big flat plate that actually yeah it actually up, comes up behind your helmet, head normally drill and tap your helmet with these with a hook point in your helmet or if your helmet already has yeah, it. some already a lot of them do have exactly them right. yeah. and you clip straps onto the Hans device and range of movement is essentially not there I right mean, it's, you're you're not turning your head you know, like this anymore you're not looking up and down it's what your eyes can do and that's what you got and, and I believe that, that that brace is designed for a guy racing NASCAR or drag racing things like that I do understand racing side by side you want to see around you you want to see where, who's coming blah 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 but that is the most protection you can possibly get that is um and that's a lot of money to spend on a neck brace, but what's the safety worth You're to exactly you? I right. mean, yeah, you know. I, I get it. I know I haven't invested in one yet, but... Yeah, a brace like this is affordable and well, well worth it. Oh, yeah. Again, they're not super comfortable. I'm no. not going to sit here and tell you that you don't notice it's on you because you do. Yeah. But at the end of the day, over a hard rollover, you're going to be just fine. Well, and I noticed... So I started out with the cheap one running it, and I've stepped up and stepped up and stepped up. And I noticed that when I got out of the cheap one and I got into either of these, really, this one didn't help as much, but that one, um, after a race, like the next day, my neck wasn't sore from being beat around side to side and stuff. One thing you'll notice if you've never ran one to running one the very first time, you'll strap your helmet tighter because the helmet wants to move more because the bra- it's doing its job. I mean, right. the, the, you're moving around, the brace is hitting the helmet, pushing the helmet off, so you got to strap the helmet tighter to keep the helmet down where right. it belongs. That's one of the first things I've noticed. And I've let people wear them and things like that. I see them come up and their helmets, you know, up to their cheeks because the brace is pushing it off their head because they you know it's essentially doing its job. Strap the helmet down a little tighter. Right. You know? Yeah, I agree. It, it's a good thing to have. I think it's overlooked by a lot of at least local racers. Uh, but a neck brace is something that I think every side-by-side racer should invest in. Absolutely. So, I 100% agree. That That's kind of just my opinion. Okay. So there was a debate going on between me and another guy. Uh, Someone, and I'm sure you've seen, and I'm sure you've heard this question asked a million times, but I figured you're coming, you're the prime guy to ask. So Facebook Keyboard Warriors rose up, and a guy asked, who builds a good turbo kit for my XP-1000? And I don't know if that was his exact question, but he, you know, who builds a turbo kit for my XP-1000? I didn't have a good answer for him because I don't know who builds aftermarket turbo kits that are good. So that's not the question. My response to him was buy a turbo. That exact <laughs> thing. I, I, all I said was you're better off financially 
and heartache wise to sell yours, mm -hmm. your XP 1000 and buy a turbo yep. machine. Absolutely. Here, here's where I go with it on this. I can even step this down even a, a notch smaller. I have a guy with a 900 XP that says, I want to run with my buddy that has a 1000. Buy a 1000. Right. It's that simple. What it's going to take to make your 900 run like a 1000, and don't get me wrong, it's not a whole bunch. I mean, you can make those 900s run very well, pretty affordable, but what you have in that machine to be able to run with the 1000, you can sell your machine, go buy a four or five year newer machine with less miles and already have that horsepower starting out. Right. And you're much, much more reliable. And have room to grow in Absolutely. horsepower at that point, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. You know, um, not to mention in that, in that conversion, you gain suspension things, you gain right. tire size, you just gain so much. Going from a base 1000 XP to a turbo, first of all, I would never turbo 1000 XP. If I'm one horsepower, I'm not hanging a turbo on it to get it. I can tell you that for sure. Yeah. I've built some horsepower of a 1000. Our old race buggy was a 1000 and still runs very strong. But uh, that wouldn't be my choice. The plus, it's got to be like three thousand dollar kit. I have no idea. They are roughly three thousand dollars for the kit. One, you know? There's a couple companies, but you know, we'll leave names out of it. But so yes, the, just just the kit, like no labor, no nothing, just, just to order it is about three thousand. Let's just say you're three grand for the kit. Does that come with tuning? Uh, it came with the new ECU okay, at that so, point. So yes, so you're plugging. So three thousand dollars is essentially plug and play or bolt and play, however you want to consider it. Right. You're at least four or five hours worth of work, I would say, at the bare minimum. Uh, yeah. You're uh, now throwing boost at an engine that's not designed for boost. Ring in gap, compression, all that stuff matters when you're throwing throwing boost at an engine. True. You're probably going to grenade it in the near future. Maybe the, not out of the hole, but, you The know. transmissions are different on the yes, XP-1000s yes. and can be problematic yep. when you start putting high horsepower to them. Clutching is going to be different. Belt size is different. You know, like all these different things come into play. At the end of the day, you can sell your 1,000 XP. Let's just say it's a decent machine. Sell for twelve, thirteen thousand dollars for fifteen or sixteen. Go. You can. You bought a new one for what? Seventeen one out the door. Go buy a brand new one for four thousand dollars more and and have a brand new machine. Yeah, hands down, not worth it. Not worth the money. Yeah, I completely agree. I had one guy who was saying. Well, I've built plenty of those and put turbos on them. They hold together just fine. I told, I stated it as calmly as I can, which sometimes isn't all that <laughs> calm. But uh, I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying no one's ever done it. I'm saying financially, financially and starting out with a new machine, then you would be way oh, yeah. better ahead. And plus, okay, so the XP1000 makes 110 horsepower, according to Polaris. We'll just take their numbers as, as true. Uh, the XP Turbo is 168. We all know you can take that 168, and it's not that hard to get them to 200. Absolutely not. If it's a rocket ship like your machine, it would, <laughs> you know, and that would that cost you? You had what? 400, 400 yeah. 450 bucks yeah, or something so, like that. So let's just say 500 dollars takes you close to 200. Yeah. You can't take 500 dollars and make an XP 1000 even 150. Right. You can't do it. Well, I, even if you spent the $3,000 on the XP-1000, you're probably only going to get it to maybe 168 maybe, maybe. 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 And then you couldn't take another $500 and chuck at it to no, get it to the 200 Yeah, you're money ahead. And I, I've said that for years. You know, even back racing ATVs, a guy had a 300X. He wanted to make it run with the 400X. Go buy a 400X. You got a 400X, you'll make it run with a 450? Go buy a 450. Yeah. You know, it's just that simple. And, yeah, it's not... If, if you want to have a one-off machine and you want to say you have a 1,000 or a 1K turbo as a big description online, go do it. Put a turbocharger on it, but not financially the best no. decision to make if you're purely looking for horsepower. Right. I'm not, and there's nothing wrong with an XP1000 machine at all. No. They make great low-end power. Um, for what 99% of the world does, it is a great machine yeah, for him. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I got a, you know, I would say Mapes's machine. Um, it's got more power this year than it had last year. I would put it hand in hand on a whole shot with all the turbo cars with someone that was a really good starter. And I'd say they'd come out front, but there's a lot of money synced into that to get that. And it isn't going to get, it's pretty much tapped. It's, it's, it's at not, the top of where it's, it's probably going to get more. 
you're exactly right. And uh, maybe a fresh rebuild, and you know, you can port and polish the heads a yeah, little bit more and get dicey with it. You it's could got maybe all that already, so, well, but I'm saying yeah. if you really got yeah. you really got brave with that die grinder, you could maybe yeah. eke a couple more horsepower you're, out. You're, you're, it's tapped, and that's it's just the financial gain is not it's just not worth it. I to do that. I completely agree. But as a guy who's in the industry and who builds the motors and who does all that. You know, I know, like you said, you haven't done the turbo kits, but I wouldn't. If someone, I would do it if someone really asked. But I would, I would to try everything I could to talk them out of it because at the end, at the end of the day, they're going to be disappointed. And if I can educate my customers a certain direction, it may not be the best financial thing for me at the time, but I want them forever as right. customers. I don't want to make a whole bunch of money off of them today. I want to keep them forever as a customer. You know, and if I can lead them in the right direction, I'm going to. I'm going to give you my honest opinion on which way I would go with something, whether it benefits me or doesn't. That's yep. I'm, that's how I'm going to shoot you. Well, okay, i got one more question before we get to your trivia. I know trivia is your favorite part. I, I thought we were skipping it. <laughs> no, we're, we're go not. long so we can skip that We're not thing. skipping it. I don't care how long we did go. Did you dumb it down like kindergarten style for me? Or? I don't know <laughs> if I did or not. I made this one up about a week ago. So I know you, you have gotten rid of your race buggy that you had. You've talked about, you know, maybe getting rid of the dynamics machine that you have, the 18. Have you made a decision on which way you're going with anything yet? <laughs> um, no. No? The flat answer to the question is no. The, sh- the short answer is yes. The big answer is no. Um, I'm going to do something. We are making some changes in the business that is a big financial situation. Right. Um, we're adding some things. We're actually moving warehouses and going bigger and some things like that. Um Maybe I'm going to go to some um, automated conveyor belt stuff for, you know, moving parts around because these parts are getting so heavy. and Yeah, to carry them around. Exactly. So um, I have a lot of outgo on that stuff right now. Right. Um, in about two months, hopefully that's all tied up. I know where I'm sitting, and I will have something for this year. Not sure what it will be yet, but I will have something. I also, a little personally about me, I bought a piece of property down in Tennessee yep. that uh, I do really enjoy recreational riding. It's probably my, it, I probably enjoy it a little bit more than racing. Um, I just enjoy going out and riding with a couple guys in the middle of nowhere and doing the most challenging trails in, in the park. And um, I bought a piece of property in Tennessee, so there's some income there. But I will do something. I am not sure yet. I have, I have decided against the RS1. Have I, you? Was, I was going to do... A turbo, a factory turbo RS1 with dynamic suspension. I was going to do it. Didn't we just talk about this yeah. turbo? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do it. I was going to use all factory player stuff. Um, I was going to do it just because no one has done it. And that's why I wanted to do it. And I love the dynamics. And after talking to some shot guys, they said they could tune it for the different geometry. And I thought it'd be really, really neat. A heck of a show piece, a great marketing piece. But I've decided financially against that, I will go with a strictly turboed. Um, car players turbo car of some sort most likely will be a dynamics now will i turn my trail buggy into my race buggy and buy a turbo s as a trail buggy i don't know yet but i'll Maybe. tell you that probably if i can squeak that past the misses that's probably gonna happen <laughs> okay so why not get you know i don't need to i don't need to buy another turbo i already got a turbo no let's, get, let's turn Just, that one into the race, race that one yeah. yeah so um I will, I'm not going to follow any particular series this year. I'm going to ride with Cam as much as I possibly can. That'd be good. Um, I want to chase Steve as much as I can as far as going with him. I want to help. You know, I want to be there, trackside support with my knowledge and, uh, you know, Steve's what he wants to do this year. I want I would like to be there to help him. You know, if I yeah. can be trackside assistance, I'm going to be. So I will not chase any particular series this year. I want to go out and have fun. Race the ones that you can make and have fun doing it. You're exactly right. Yeah. Um, I stepped out two years ago to help run the Midwest Series since we're not doing it. And then my, my wife raced, so I've really been out of the seat for a couple of years. I want to get back in the seat. Use that as leverage. Yes, have some fun. I will race Harlan <laughs> for sure. Um, but uh, I have no particular series I'm running. I will race the ones I can, go to the ones I can, and, and just have fun this year. That sounds like a great plan. Yeah. Sometimes that's better to take the year off and just kind of clear everything and start again. And I seen Casey got a, a big one. I, AXCC's uh, going to Casey. It was announced today. Uh, this is recorded on Monday, so this is coming out tomorrow. But yeah, uh, Casey, Illinois, which isn't that far no, from me or you. That's in my backyard. I mean, that's my home track growing up. So it was really exciting. Uh, 
I don't know if I had anything to do with that, but I pushed hard and made a couple phone calls for that. Um, got a phone call from Steve saying, you need to make a phone call. They're thinking about going there. And I, yep. I did, and I hope it worked. And uh, I'm really excited for that. If I, I When is that? When is, I didn't even see when it's June. Oh, I think yeah. it's June. I'll be there racing that one. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot of guys, a lot of local guys that I talk to have said the same thing. I'm going to race that one because it's yeah. local. Yeah. So that'll be good. Uh, that'll, that'll be a fun one. Yeah, and I think they'll have a big turnout. I really do. Yeah. I, I think we're UTV heavy in this area. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, having a race in this area is a smart decision. Uh, I think I just briefly seen something, but someone said something about a race at Crawfordsville. That'd be great, too. You know, if that happens, I think that'd be a great place for another, you know, for them to go. So. Yeah. No, really looking forward to it. Lots of big things coming this year. I think it'll be fun. Yep. So now are you ready for your favorite part of the I whole show? This, this is why I almost don't do these shows. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> Whenever you have, you don't have Doug, you just get me, I guess. It's the yeah. scraps, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't think all of these are really hard. Doug's a genius, though, so he don't even hardly. He's you know. pretty smart at a lot of this stuff. So, All right. Question number one. In ancient Egypt, law enforcement trained two animals to help them. What two animals did they train? I'm going to go with the German Shepherd because that's about standard. Okay. Mm. I don't even know another one that would even... Cats? No. Dogs and monkeys. (laughs) They trained monkeys. To help them. I, I don't know all what capacity, because this is way before my days, obviously. But Monkeys are smart, so, yeah. you know. Train a monkey, yeah, whatever. Right. So, okay. Question number two. The biggest tsunami on record hit, and I'll probably butcher this, it's uh, Lituya Bay, L-I-T-U-Y-A Bay in Alaska in 1958. How tall was the tsunami? 20 miles tall. 20 miles tall. 20 miles tall. You overshot that a bit. <laughs> 1,720 feet tall. That's big. That's still a big wave. That's that's a big wave. How'd you like to see that coming as you're relaxing no, on the beach? No way. That's a wall of water coming at you. <laughs> yes, that is. That I mean, that's essentially like a 15, 16 story building, roughly yeah. in that. Yeah. That's, and I don't know how wide it was, but it sure isn't narrow like a building even. No, no. No. That did some damage when it came crashing down. I'm sure it did. (laughs) All right, question number three. This one's right up your alley. Neutron stars can rotate how fast? A neutron star is a star that's born from a core collapse supernova. So this is (laughs) going to be in a speed, right? Yes. Like like miles per hour. Uh, This one is in how many rotations per second? So it's in an RPM. Mm. Or not RPM, RPS. Yeah. 1,500? Nope. Not quite that fast. It'll rotate it between 60 and 600 times a second. And just so you know, these are about 150 times the size of the Earth, and they're rotating that fast. Wow. Wow. And the Earth rotates essentially one time per day. Yes. That's some speed. That You're not standing (laughs) on that one. It's going to chuck you off. No. 600 times a second. And it's 150 times the size of the Earth. So your point from the center rotation is that much further out. Think of how much. Think of the wind movement off of that sucker. Yeah. (laughs) I can't believe we can't feel it. Yeah. Well, they're a long ways away. Space is big. All right. Speaking of space, what is, and this happens in space. So explain what is cold welding in space. So what is, so it's basically... I'm going to go when like it's so cold two rocks form together? No, not really. So what it is in space, because there is no air, there's no water, there's no nothing like that, when two of the same metals come together and they touch, they instantly and permanently fuse together and can't be pulled apart. There's no I- distinguishable difference. So, really? Yep. Well, hmm. So if you think about like, okay, if you have a bottle of water and you dump it in a bucket of water, you can't differentiate now the The water between the what was bucket water and what was bottle water um whereas if you take a bottle of water in something like a container the bottle and you put it in there this is like our atmosphere Mm -hmm. where it's got something in between it when there's nothing between it they just instantly fuse and become one and you can't get them apart wow that'd be neat to see that would be let's go to space (laughs) slamming metal together (laughs) 
<laughs> All right, question number five. What is the most expensive tea in the world? Mm, like a location of where this is at or what's it, what kind is it called? Uh, what is it called? Or if you can give me the price, I'll okay. take either one. Um, you probably have a better chance at guessing a price. That's what I'm going to go with. I've been going high on everything else. So I'm going to go, like just, it's just a glass of tea, like a cup of tea. Um, so let's go by per the pot. Cause that's, I have two different. So like if you brewed a pot of tea, I'm going to go with, it's going to cost $130. No, it's called Da Hong Pao tea. And it costs fourteen hundred dollars per gram, and to make one pot is approximately ten thousand dollars. Oh wow! Should have went high there. See, I've been going yeah, high. Been go- else. Yeah. <laughs> and then you just undershot it there a little bit. So that's an expensive pot of tea. Yeah, it is. I, I don't mind drinking tea, but I'm not drinking that. Yeah, no kidding. I can do a lot more with that money. So build a race buggy. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can start off with a race yes. buggy. You know, you start with ten thousand, then you put another twenty or so in it. In it. You yeah. Got something. Yeah. All right, question number six. How many pounds of cheese does the average American eat in a year? Well, if you're Cody Wollenberg, you eat zero pounds. I know you I don't eat cheese, cheese <laughs> which is strange. I mean... So the people that hang around me eat more than normal because I always like... I even peel my cheese off my pizza and give it to the next guy next to me, so... So you just eat like the bread and the sauce? Yeah, it's the greatest. Really? Yeah, you wrap like it up it? in the... Yeah, it's good. I, I, I have no problem eating pizza. See, my wife thinks I'm crazy because I order... If I'm just like... I'm the only one eating it, I'll order pizza with no sauce. Oh, I... See, I order extra sauce because you pull a lot of the sauce off with the cheese. And yeah. You pull the cheese off. But uh, I don't eat cheese. That's... Unless it's fake. I eat Doritos. I eat mac and cheese because it's got powdered cheese. I will not eat Velveeta and cheese. But anyway. Huh. Um, Pounds of cheese. 1,600 pounds. No. They don't eat that much. That's crazy. See, I'm back high again. <laughs> 23 pounds. Wow. That's, that's, I figured it'd be a lot more than that, really. Yeah, it could be. I've seen some people. There <laughs> may be some people that eat that 1,500 or whatever you guess. I just figured it'd be a couple pounds of cheese a day some people would eat. And some so. people could, yes. No, not me. All right, question number seven. What is the name of King Kong's home island? I have zero idea. Never seen any of the movies? Nope. I'm not a movie buff. I'm not either. Uh, it is Skull Island. That makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. I'm not a huge movie I buff either. Know. I'd much rather be in the garage yeah. than watching movies. My dad was saying to me the other day, uh, my wife and I went to a movie Saturday, and it's the first time we've been out to a movie in probably a year or more. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and I told him, and he goes, oh, there's a bunch of big movies coming out this year. You know, my parents are movie buffs. They mm-hmm. go to all kinds of movies. They're like, oh, the new Avengers is coming out. I'm like, what number are they on? And he's <laughs> he's like, haven't you seen this one? No. Haven't you seen this one? No. I mean, I just don't watch them. That's my wife, too. She's a huge movie. But we have a, we have a in-home theater system, and I don't ever watch movies. Yeah, I can't. I'm the kind of guy that I work, and I sleep, and I work. So if I try to watch a movie, I'm sleeping in the movie. You yeah, know? I I. I do okay. I can go with my wife and watch a movie and stuff like that, but I don't sit down and watch movies. No. My mind's racing about what can I go Next, do? Yes. Like 10 minutes into a show, I'm like, I'm bored. <laughs> I need something to do. All right. Uh, there's amazingly another cheese one on here, and I don't know how two cheese ones got on with you not liking cheese. I knew that. <laughs> All right. Question number eight. What cheese is served with a classic Greek salad? So this is more cooking. What type of cheese? Yes. Mm, cheddar? Nope. It is feta cheese. Hmm. Never would have guessed that. Never even no. heard of that kind of cheese. I don't know nothing about cheese, but it's nasty. It's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's moldy milk. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's gross. gross. <laughs> it's what it is. All right. Question number nine. How many keys does a baby grand piano have? Hmm. 44. You're half right. It's 88. <laughs> <laughs> now, 88 keys on a baby grand piano. So. That's, that's a lot. It is. I People I, know how to play those things. Yeah, I, I don't. I never. I can play like a few little songs, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, <laughs> stuff like that. You're one step ahead of me. Yeah, I don't know. So, all right. Question number 10, last one. What bird is New Zealand's national symbol? What kind of bird? Yeah. Mm, I'm going to just left field this one, a peacock. Nope, the kiwi. Didn't know that was kind of a bird. You didn't? It's a drink. <laughs> or a fruit. It's a fruit. Yeah. They probably put it in drinks. I know, I, I'm a kiwi guy. I like, like 
kiwi fruit punches and things. So yeah, yep. I so growing up, I didn't eat a lot of fruit when I was a kid and stuff. So you know, I got to adult age and started eating fruit and stuff. My wife bought kiwis. Apparently, you know, you're not supposed to eat the skin on the outside. I just ate it like an apple. Yeah, I've never had the actual fruit. I always. Oh, just, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just eat the skin, the little furry brown skin, and all. I was like, <laughs> apparently, you can eat it. it. Didn't hurt me. I mean, <laughs> she's uh, like, yeah. you can't eat that. No, I did. I did. Watch yeah. me. Um, yeah, and a guy I work with saw me eating. He's like, "What's wrong with you? Why, <laughs> why do you eat the skin?" I'm like, "It's easier than peeling it. I don't know." Yeah, no kidding. So I just eat it. So. I don't have any amazing, stupid stuff with me that I wrote down, so we're just going to wrap it up. Is there anything you want to tell everybody about how to get a hold of you guys and, you know? Definitely call the shop anytime. Um, CW Motorsports uh, Facebook page. Um, The website is CWRZR Parts, so it's CWRazorParts.com. Sorry, K&M guys. Hopefully there's something coming in the future for you. <laughs> that is that is big talk. Um, we've got the Razor thing pretty well dialed out, so that's possibly where we're headed next. Yeah. Um, and they need it too, you know. There's 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 a few guys out there that are doing it, but the full circle is what what I feel like they need. And I'm not brand, I don't not like if you ride a can am. I just do players as because of pure numbers. I mean, right. And that's what I kind of started off riding when I got into the side by side game. But uh, yeah, so the Facebook page CW Motorsports. You can call the shop anytime two one seven three four two two nine six seven. I will say I'm pretty tough to get a hold of, but uh, Facebook message me. Facebook message Allie. She helps out um, me a lot. But uh, we'll definitely get back to you as soon as we can. I think I tag you in at least 20 or 30 things a day. Everybody does, and I love it. <laughs> I've actually got something coming. I'm gonna. It's called like the tag bag that I'm going to start sending people. The people that repetitively tag us and stuff, you're going to get goodies in the mail. That's uh, simple. Yeah, well, that'd be neat. Yeah, we pulled some marketing dollars off the radio and things like that. We're going to put it all online. And we did a great Valentine's Day giveaway, and that was all Allie and my wife. Yeah, and, I saw uh, that. That was good. Yeah, it's like that. It was so for those of you guys that didn't see it, what they did was they put together like a women's riders pack. Yeah, they ask like- they ask a week before what do you, what do the must haves for girls that are riding. And a lot of girls responded back, and my wife's very particular about things, and she went through everybody's comments and wrote down, you know, and picked out all the popular stuff and put it together in a basket, and we gave it away, giving it away for Valentine's Day. Yeah, so. It's neat I, stuff. I need, I need to win that so I don't have to buy my wife nothing. Give your wife <laughs> yeah. that. This is all the stuff you yeah. want. And, and it, it's a, I mean, it's a nice. There's even there's, a pair of boots in there. There's a pair of Hunter boots. So if you know what that is, it's like the coach boots or the, you I, know, the I, Louis Vuitton boots of a girl's world. It's a very high end pair of boots. I, I do the Muck brand yeah. boots. Yeah. They're, they're nice. They're just as expensive, I think, if not more expensive than the Muck boots. And it's a rubber boot. But yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, it's, it's what the girls wanted. And I think it's great. A uh, huge response. And, uh, and purple people personally messaged me saying, you know, like that's awesome that you're doing that. And that's, that's where we're headed this year. That's what's, that's what's to come for us this year. We're going to be very online heavy and we'll do a lot of give backs and uh, give back to the people that are giving to us. Yeah. It's great. That I think nothing but great things coming yeah, for you guys. Exactly. I'm looking forward to seeing where you guys go. We jumped on board to help with Steve as a sponsorship this year and uh, with cam. And uh, so there, I think there's some more coming yeah. with that. So. Good deal like to see it. So we're going to say thanks to our sponsors, of course, title sponsor, CW Motorsports here with Cody. And we have Watch Communications, who provides our hosting for our website and also the podcast. Uh, we also have TGM Offroad. And they are just kind of a group of guys that like to get together and ride. They do a lot of the trail riding stuff. They got some cages from me just the other day. Oh, did they? Yeah. yeah. yeah see, there you go. Mm-hmm. Look, we're bringing people <laughs> together. I'm doing something, <laughs> something beneficial anyway. And we also have Spang's Fab, uh, you know, Kevin Spangler over there. He makes good products mm-hmm. that are, he's done a few race builds for guys this year. I know Steve had a new cage built for him and Mike Plank had cage and some rock sliders and bumpers built. Yep. And so, yeah, good people. And we're glad that all you guys come along, help us. And, you know, like, we're, we're glad to have you. You guys, what you guys do is awesome. I've always said that, you know, you know we try. Your your uh, your presence and your drive and your um, passion for the industry is great. You know, really is. Yeah, and stupidity some days. You know, sometimes it's but you get more attention being laughed at than doing something good. <laughs> Even when Doug's like halfway around the world, you know, <laughs> trying to be Mister Important. You know, <laughs> he's uh he should be his plane's just landing right now. Is it? So yep, he's just landing. Home for a little bit and gone again. He's only home for like a month and then he's yeah. gone. Where does he go next? I don't know. Somewhere. So is it a big secret? What's in the driveway? Does anyone know about that? 
Uh, yeah, they, they kind of know. Well, so these, what Cody's talking about is these the guys are going. These guys are going big time. I, mean, I don't like, know about big time. Big time motorhome status this year, guys. It's big. Watch out. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about how big. No, and that's great. You know, I've uh, I've been tossed hard on what to go in close trailer with a with a motorhome or a toy haul. You know, the the benefit of the motorhome is is you have all the amenities while driving. And yes, you put a ton of miles on going to these races. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, we I've talked about it, and I think in I've had my truck that I have now for fourteen months, and I put fifty two thousand miles on it in a year, a little over a year. Well, I pulled my toy hauler so much it caught on fire last year. So yeah. <laughs> I'm without one, and I will be getting one very soon. I I keep saying I need to buy one now because now's the time to buy. But uh, if anyone's got a toy hauler for sale or knows someone with a toy hauler for sale, I am looking. Yep. Our motorhome, I would not be against that at all. An RV. So that gave me a perfect ending, and I'll do the Doug ending. So no matter how many times you catch your toy hauler on fire, <laughs> thanks for riding along with us. Thanks a lot, guys. Going down, tired of myself, tired of this town.